The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You are back in the House of Mystery, and Mr. Joe Goldberg is here. Happy to be here, Alan. Oh, I'm happy you're happy. Makes me happy. I'm still feeling hoarse from the, it's been four weeks with COVID, but I'm, I'm pretty much normal at, well, as normal as it's going, I'm ever going to be called. Yeah. Um, the ears are back. Um, I'm starting to smell coffee, but I still taste nothing. So that might be gone forever. Ouch. They say that some people don't get it back. Yeah. Yeah. Ouch. It's, I, I find it really irritating with food. Yeah, no kidding. Um, because it's just, there's just not, you would not believe how much more food tastes when you can smell it. I'll just say that, you know, like a steak or anything like that. It, it just, when there's nothing, nothing, and you go to eat it, there's just, it's crazy the difference without that. I, that's all I can say. It's crazy. I'm not sure I can handle that. No, no, because you're a big, huge meat eater, right? You know, I'm a meat eater. I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Iowa. Yeah, yeah. You're, Give me some you're, beef. you're every cow's friend. Uh, go, moving on. Now we are. We're going to get. Are you strapped in? We're going to get scared today because we're talking to a man that writes thrillers and westerns and crime fiction. You know, um, he might be packing heat. He's a professional. Yeah. He's a professional. He knows how to smoke and shoot at the same time. Uh, Mr. Terrence McCauley, well, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me, Alan. Thank you, Joe. This is great to be here. We'll see if you say that at the end of the show. <laughs> Chop him down. Chop him. Yeah. This might, this might not be that great. Um, well, first of all, Terrence, like, who are you? Like, where did you come from? I, and I say this, like, you've got a ton of books out. Yes. I don't know how many. So you've written a lot of books. You're obviously doing this very full time. So Right. Well, um, I grew up in the Bronx, New York. And like I said before we started, um, I grew up with uh, a lot of people who were uh, great storytellers. And I grew up in a building that had a lot of different people from a lot of different parts of the world who lived there. And um, my mom and I and my father interacted with all of them. So I had no choice but to absorb it all and uh, appreciate the differences and the different types of stories and their backgrounds, where they came from. I also come from a long line of storytellers. My uh, two uncles were Catholic priests in the Archdiocese of New York, so they had a lot of stories to share. One of them was a chaplain in Bedford Hills Correction Facility. So they, uh, he, uh, my uncle Jimmy, was a uh, uh, the chaplain for a lot of people uh, who were in the papers, uh, Amy Fisher and a couple of other people who were famous back in the 80s and 90s. So Thanksgiving was always an interesting time around the dinner table. And, um, you know, I also grew up with a grandmother who had raised a family through two world wars and a Great Depression and saw a lot of life. So as an only child, I used to sit around and listen to the people, uh, the the adults while they spoke because my grandmother always said no one ever learned anything by running their mouth and so it was like a sponge so I, I picked up all of this I not only picked up what they did but I picked up their life stories as well um, I went to school became uh, got a BA from Fordham in political science and worked in government for 25 years and I wound up over that time getting an awful lot of my own stories uh, to throw into the mix but I quickly realized that working in an office the rest of my life wasn't going to be for me. And I wanted to relate that, my, the stories and tell stories in my own way. So when I was in college, I took a creative writing course. The writing that I did there was fairly popular among my fellow students. And then I uh, went ahead and uh, started doing it uh, after work and on weekends. And it became an obsession with me. And so I wrote my first book, and when that didn't sell, I did what any other Irishman would do and wrote another. Uh, that one, I changed the genres. I wrote it uh, set in 1930s New York uh, called Prohibition. Then I, uh, a friend of mine told me that there was a writing contest that was uh, happening from Court TV at the time, Search for the Next Great Crime Writer Contest. So I submitted my manuscript. 
and it wound up beating out over 200 other um, stories to win the award. And so I had a writing contract. I was very happy, it was, but it was with Borders. And we all know what happened with Borders. Uh, unfortunately, they went out of business and my deal went along with it. But I stuck with it. And uh, thankfully, uh, we're about 25 books into my career now. There, there's always an element that um, happens when you are brave enough to do something like that. Because when you're writing, it doesn't matter. It seems like, to me, your two main themes are westerns or kind of um, es- espionage or a thriller sort of thing. But you've got to put a lot of yourself into your writing, especially your characters and, and, and the stories. Right come from like you said from your own experience when 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 that's mm-hmm. there you're exposing yourself to the public and the public as we all know can be you know assholes they're they're not always the nicest people and with public uh, with social media and the way everything is now um what was it that what gives you that strength to kind of go over and write a lot of books and just not care? Well, when I started, uh, I've always been a voracious reader since I left college. Uh, I wasn't really a big reader in school, believe it or not. A lot of writers are able to tell stories about when they were kids. They always had their nose in a book. I was always more of a TV kid, but I grew up watching uh, classic films on Channel 13 on Saturday nights. We didn't have cable. And then um, when Turner Classic Movies came along, and I did have cable, I watched a lot of those stories. And I liked how they, even if they weren't very well made, they always had a, a good bit of truth to them. There was dialogue. There was a scene. There was something that I could derive from it, even if it was a B or C movie. And I, when I began reading on my own, I found a couple of books that I liked, but I couldn't stop in the back of my mind saying, I could do this a little bit different. Oh, I wish so-and-so had done this. I wish the character had done that. And my talent for writing and the the thrill I got from doing it made me want to tell stories of my own. So that's why I decided to put myself out there. And you're right. It's a a very personal thing that a writer does. Um, I just put something in a newsletter that I send out where I recalled what one of my early writing mentors, Wesley Gibson, told me. And he said that when you're writing, it's a very personal engagement between the writer and the world because you're taking your own perceptions about everything that's happened to you, whether it's science fiction or romance or Western or modern day, and you're putting it out there for the entire world to say, and you're exposing a certain part of, your aspect of, of what makes you human. And that's, that's difficult. So I started when social media really wasn't as, uh, as big as it is now. But, um, you know, I found that even though the social media realm is a lot nastier than it used to be and it's getting nastier every day, uh, it, it allows me to get feedback from my audience and that really impacts my writing. It impacts what I'm working on now. And it impacts the kinds of stories I want to tell in the future, whether it's a Western, a thriller, or uh, it's set in the 1930s. Well, let's go. Terrence, you have several series across different genres. Let's go back to the emotion question. How do you impart the storytelling across all these different characters, lead characters, and they're across the different genres? Where do you find, are they all the same? Are they, what is the, the emotional hook you find for making these different series and main characters across the genres right well it's it's that variation that i that makes me want to do work in a lot of different genres um with the thrillers for example i was able to talk about how technology shapes not only what we do every day but how other people can reach into our lives and find out more about us than ever before uh and then i enjoyed writing about Characters who weren't necessarily wearing white hats all the time, but they weren't black hats either. They weren't anti-heroes. They were complicated people. And whatever praise I've gotten for any of my work, it's always been that the characters have been interesting and relatable. And I find that is what brings people back to my work over and over again, Uh, whether it's an espionage story set in modern day or um, when I write about the 1930s, I definitely try to have a, a sense of what 
that era really was, not just what we see in the Jimmy Cagney movies or in the pastiche works that come after it nowadays. Uh, a lot of them are accurate, some of them aren't, some of them have a modern bent to them, but I find that even if I'm writing about a, a, a United States Marshal in Montana in 1888, the setting is one thing, the period is one thing, but good storytelling and good characters are relatable across any number of genres. And that's what I strive to do. That's, that's very interesting. So let me, let me flip it. Besides setting and besides characters, what's the difficulty difference or if there is any uh, going through different genres? What did you find? Oh, I'm, I've written espionage, and I got writer of Western. Was there some barrier or mental thing that you said, this is a whole different genre, I need to think a different way? Right. It, you, well, one certainly has to do that, especially if they're going to do more than one series, much let alone uh, more than one genre. But for me, I've always got many stories percolating in the back of my mind, uh, even when I don't realize it. Everything I take in, everything I read, everything I see, it gets stored there. And as I'm beginning to move through a project, it boils to the front. Uh, perfect example, I don't outline any of my stories. Um, I keep an idea in my mind about when I'm writing my thrillers, what happened before, what characters I could bring forward, um, but I don't outline. So it happens for me the same way it happens for the reader. And a lot of my audience has said they like that about my work, that it doesn't seem planned, that it seems to evolve naturally. And that's what I strive to do. Uh, Westerns, for example, people go into it with a certain mindset that it's going to be just a shoot 'em up. It's just going to be the good guy walks in the middle of town and they have a shootout with the bad guy and then it's all over. Or, God forbid, they go up against some wild Indians and he saves the day and rides off with the girl at the end. I don't want to write stories like that. And I never, I always try to see what came before me, what the tropes are, so I can avoid them as much as possible. Because uh, one thing I don't want to do is become predictable or fall into a, a trope trap, if you will. So there's always something different to each of my work, and that keeps my creativity fresh, too. That's why I've jumped from genres, and then I try to circle back whenever I can. The thrillers are more action-oriented. Um, and have a technical aspect of it, but I'm not a, a spy, I'm not an assassin, so I can't speak to that, but I can speak to the human aspect of it. And that's what the reader can relate to. With my Westerns, I grew up in the Bronx. It's as far away from a horse as you could possibly get, but a story is still a story. It's about a struggle for what one character wants to achieve versus who is trying to stop them. And that's what it is at its heart. So I tried to keep that going through the two series I've been fortunate enough to continue to write uh, in my Westerns as well. And then with the uh, 1930s stuff, there's it's so rich with moder modernity uh, back then. People think it was just a, a Victorian time and it was an innocent time, but it wasn't. People were worldly. People faced a lot of the same struggles that we face today. It was a Great Depression, for God's sake. So... There's definitely a lot of relatability about what we're going through now and what we're going through then. And I always try to keep that constant throughout my work. Yeah, I was actually surprised when I, I just did a couple of books from the 20s. And going through all the newspapers, I, th there were so many similarities to what we see now. You know, the names change, but there's still a lot of the same fights, so to speak and the sure. same, same kind of beliefs and arguments and stuff. How, how important, like, and how much time do you spend to researching the time period? Like when you were talking about the 30s and and uh, things like that, are you really into following up what happens and even, even the, the language people use? Sure, sure. It definitely helps. I mean, there's, um, there's a great movie, if you're talking about the 1930s, called Miller's Crossing. Which is written in, which is by the Cohen brothers, a phenomenal movie, one of my favorites. And it's written almost entirely in 1930s slang, which makes it difficult for us to follow. But if you put the time into it, it's beautifully shot. It's incredibly acted and directed, but it also sounds like a Shakespearean play almost where you have to adjust yourself to the heightened language in order to understand what's going on. Now, 
if, if someone's reading something like that, it's not going to translate well to the book. But keeping that kind of theme where I try to speak as close as possible to the way people spoke back then, uh, from, based on what I've read and some of the movies I've seen, uh, that helps. That helps add authenticity. When I'm doing something for uh, a thriller genre, for example, my university series, I did a lot of research into what uh, Edward Snowden released at the time. And that helped me get up to speed on what people could do and what technology could do. And, and that's changed in the years since those books came out. And I've tried to update them as I go along in my more recent uh, entries into that series. But uh, in terms of that, it's funny, it, it takes place in today's time, but there's definitely a significant amount of research as I try to keep up with the technology. About the, the toughest research I had to do, believe it or not, was for the Westerns, because it is a very highly educated group of people who read Westerns who know that world very well. A lot of them have lived it. A lot of them are familiar with it. So in terms of knowing what guns were used back then, the calibers, what they could do, what happened, uh, even the parts of a saddle and a horse, believe it or not, they all come in handy to tell a richer story. So I actually did found myself going down the rabbit hole of that. And it adds a different layer to my uh, stories when I write them. People couldn't just hop in the car and drive someplace like they could in the 30s or today. Um, journeys had to be planned out. You had to bring gear with you. You had to know where the watering holes were. Weather played a factor. Fatigue on the animals played a factor. And so for me, it, it has really helped make these stories not just about the white hat versus the black hat, but it adds to the tension and the drama of what happens on the page. Well, then how do you research that? I mean, you can't go back in time. Is it, are you reading old newspapers? Are you heading off to your locations, Montana and places to figure things out? That's a long time sure. ago. Sure. I did. Yeah. And, but, and you can see it today, but it's, it, you know, there's a, there's plenty of material that was written about back then about both fiction and, um, in the modern times as well. People who, who are constantly doing research. Uh, thank God for Google. You can always find the parts of the saddle and uh, the parts of the, of the guns that were back there that were, that were happening back then. There were there's no shortage of people who are experts and, and are happy to share their knowledge with us. And also, too, it's not just about the, the, the tactile. It's also about the way people thought, like the, what we see in all the Westerns where the good guy and the bad guy face off at high noon in the middle of Main Street, that didn't happen. And there was somebody I met out in Arizona once who said, he was a bartender at, a, at an event, and he said, put it this way, you spend all of this time, all of this money, went through all of this crap to come out here, and you're going to stand in the middle of the street and let some guy shoot at you. So it, it never happened like that. And then I, I started doing more research about Wyatt Earp, for example, he wasn't known as a gunman. He was feared because he would go up to somebody, take the gun from them, and beat them with them with it if they didn't obey his orders. So that has made its way into later movies, but that wasn't the way it was in some of the 1930s and 50s movies or television. So that that's an interesting aspect to it. And that so I always try to find little bits like that that'll make it a little bit more appealing to people. So where do your characters come from? Are you laying in bed at night and... Uh comes to you in a dream or are they people you you know that you turn into characters um and and how do you experience them are you seeing them like a you would see a movie do you hear voices like where what's your experience with writing characters well as a as a natural born watcher i just i i find that a lot of the people that i meet leave impressions on me whether it's great or small it could be the way they smoke a cigarette or the way they drive a car or something they say in a meeting, in a boardroom, that resonates with me. A, a strategy, whether it's about talking to a, uh, I came from a government relations background, so it could be the way they address a, a crowd of hostile uh, audience members, or it could be the way one of my cop friends talked about something they did during a stakeout. Uh, all of it resonates with me. And as I'm starting to think of a story, and I'm always thinking of something, a lot of that has left an impression on me and different people from my life 
who've impacted me, either good or bad, come to the fore. And I say, well, they'd be interesting in that story. Or, yeah, I saw this with something this guy did at a bar one time. I'll add that in for a little flavor. And that's what uh, makes these characters come to life for me. And I think that makes them come to life for my audience, too. These little personal touches are are great, as long as you don't get too carried away for, with it, because you don't want anybody to become a, a cartoon character of themselves. Um, you know, John Wayne was great for the Westerns, but I don't want to write a John Wayne type person. He might have some of those a- attributes, but I don't want to have a John Wayne mimeograph right on my in my in the middle of a Western. Same thing for Jimmy Cagney. Great guy, talented actor, wonderful human being, but I don't want my characters to be two-dimensional in that uh, just because they're set in the 1930s. And my spy characters certainly are James Bond types. So how do you weave in theme or message into those stories, into those characters? Um, are they, and are they different across? Are you trying to say this with the Westerns and say this with the espionage and say that with the crime? How do you, what are you trying to say in these books? With any of my past, my, my stories that are set in another era, uh, I always try to make them as relatable as possible so that we realize that our impressions of the 1930s might have come from Cagney movies and Edward G. Robinson movies, or our ideas about the West might have come from 1950s television. But the world in which these people lived was much more complicated than that, that they were, um, and that makes them relatable and interesting as I ask someone to spend several hours going on this journey with me. And it makes it more interesting for me to write if I write them as three-dimensional human beings. I usually will have an idea of what a character will look like. Uh, That's not to say that I think that they should be cast in the movie, but there's always some physical basis based on an actor or a character I read about that serves as the impetus for the protagonist. So, for example, my Terry Quinn books set in 1930s New York, the person I envisioned playing him would be Robert Ryan. And that helped me come up with a lot of his characteristics, too. Um, the person I've written a lot about back then, Charlie Doherty, would be a mixture of a great actor who's in the Mercury Theater called Paul Stewart and Bruce Willis. Um, if you saw Bruce Willis in um, The Last Boy Scout. So not his diehard stuff, but he did a little bit better acting in The Last Boy Scout. I, I thought he was pretty talented anyway. But um, that's those are the kinds of characters that stick with me. And then when I was writing Mackie, I thought of somebody like Matthew McConaughey as the main character, somebody who wasn't too pretty, but someone who had gravitas for the kind of story I was telling. So I think of them physically and then, As I'm writing them and I'm getting to know them better, their natural attributes come out, their personalities, their likes, their dislikes. And I leave that in as I put the story together. So do do you do you actually um, hear them in your in your head, your characters, or do you feel them? How do you experience them? I feel them and I hear their their voices, the way they speak. And it's it's always different for me based on the genre I'm writing. Um, my uh, uh, my uh, James Hicks character, for example, is much more sarcastic and much more worldly. So uh, for somebody like him, I envisioned um, Jeremy Renner playing him because he could be a man for all seasons. He's not just your like The Rock or Sylvester Stallone, where you know what you're getting in a movie as soon as you see them. But he's more of a dynamic character who isn't necessarily what you would expect to see in a in a um, in a spy thriller. And the scary part is when my I was fortunate enough to have Sympathy for the Devil made into an audio book. The people who produced it found a narrator who sounded exactly like the voice in my head, just like you were saying, Alan. And that freaked me out. I I, I ran out of the room. It was like I, I was watching a, an exorcism or something. It was. It was terrifying how after just a little bit of a conversation with me, he knew how I was thinking of this story and he projected it perfectly in the audio form. And that was that was something. And and I've I've never forgotten that. And that stayed with me as I'm writing my Westerns. 
the Westerns will have a more um, descriptive nature because I'm trying to get people out of what they think of from 50s television or from later Western films and really experience it how I'm experiencing it in my mind. Um, and with the 1930s, it's about trying to stay away from what we might expect, like the Tommy gun fights and the, the quips and the woman who's, uh, you know, like the, the, the gun, uh, the gun mall, let's say the gangster's woman and try to give those characters a little bit more depth based on what I saw from the older people when I was a kid who lived through that time. And they, they weren't cartoons. They were, they were real people who had their own views on life. So, uh, that's, that's the constant that I try to achieve no matter what genre I'm in. That's interesting. Terrence, when you, you talked about this a little bit earlier, is there, do you have any muses? Like, you know, I, 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 I made sure I read all of the, you know, Lamore, you know, or I read all of these kind of books to, to learn my genre. I watched all the Ray Rogers movies, um, cause I watched those too on Sunday mornings, you know, Sunday mornings at a CB on sure. WT. So what, stimulated you in, across thinking you just weren't you weren't a reader coming out of college so something something got right. you going right it was the you know movies have like i said earlier movies have always been a huge inspiration to me actors and, and good writing and, and setting have always uh, on the screen and whether it's the big screen or television they've all played a part on me and i was fortunate enough to grow up in the 80s when i there was some great television being made for example, Miami Vice, fantastic stuff. I mean, we look back on it now, we think it's just a neon glitzy mess, but the first two seasons of that were some really great writing, some awesome direction and music, and some great cinematography there. And um, they hold up, actually, in, in, in a good reading. So that impacted me. Um, something like Hill Street Blues, the depth of, of a broad character base that was able to tell a gritty story has definitely impacted my crime fiction and the kind, even though it's not set in the same time, the same place, makes me want to have that kind of, of quality to my work. And then with the Westerns, when Deadwood came out, I was fascinated by the way they went with that story, how they had the heightened English that I mentioned about Miller's Crossing earlier, but Deadwood had it and they had an awful lot of cursing and the characters weren't necessarily the kind that we've seen in, in typical Westerns. And that was a, a huge inspiration for me when I realized there's a lot more depth to the Western genre than people give it credit for. And then I started looking at movies differently that came out, and I saw that each Western was more of a reflection of its own time in which it was told rather than the time it was portrayed. So in the 1940s and 50s, you had more... Um, patriotic type westerns where everybody got together and they did the right thing. Um, then you had in the 60s, they were more counterculture uh, westerns where they were anti heroes and you know, the wild bunch. And you had the professionals and some other films that portrayed what America was going through then instead of what necessarily may have happened at the time. And then in the 80s, you had some more action based westerns. You also had some that were more conscious, like Dances with Wolves, about the plight of the natives, uh, Native Americans who were, uh, and what they endured back then. And, and then in the 90s, you had some more gritty stuff that was more like The Shield or more like, um, you know, some of the, 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 the tougher series that were on television as, as TV started to become less PG and more PG-13. Um, and we had great results from that, like Tombstone and, and Open Range and, and some others. So those were my muses, I would say, television. And then also reading a lot of the, the, the classics, like you said, like Louis L'Amour and uh, Zane Gray. And then some other uh, writers who were more modern in their approach and, and wrote modern day. Um, and so I, I read all of those and they all had an impact on me and they all helped me figure out the kind of story I could tell and change to a specific genre while remaining true to my own voice. Okay. So um, let, let's get, let's get real here now. So who do you know 
that you actually have used in your book and perhaps give them a bad experience or even killed them? <laughs> we want names. They can rub them out. How much time oh, do we you want have? names. <laughs> Come on, the middle of the street. I hate you. I'm a poppy. Yeah, I, 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 I want to get the real <laughs> stuff here. Let's get really g- dirty here. I want to, you know, someone that you used to date, and it's like, well, I'll get that. Like, come on. Let's, let's, the, the evil characters, in essence, are you able to write those without any any problems? And I say that because some of the people I've interviewed say that it's a real hard thing to get into someone that's going to be doing something bad throughout the story or they're a bad character they do evil things and to get into the head and to write them with the feelings like the smells the taste the everything because you've got to make them real and you've got to be believable when you're writing them so um do you have any issue with that or you maybe you've had some bad things that happen to you and you're pretty evil anyway (laughs) <laughs> well, uh, uh, regarding that, Senator, I can either confirm yeah, or There we go. There's the government. The government. Uh, but, yeah, there you go. But, no, in terms of inspiration, I, I get to know my villains as well as I know my protagonists. And uh, to me, it always goes towards motivation. And motivation based on whatever I write, is always going to be rooted in my own experience. So, yeah, I've seen some people do some pretty rotten things. I've had some pretty rotten things done to me, and I do use that in my writing, not necessarily verbatim, but I definitely use it when I'm trying to convey what the character is enduring at that particular time. Um, One thing is uh, I've used quite often is my own senses of abandonment or friendships that have faded away or when I wasn't necessarily as good a friend as I could have been and the regret that comes along with that. And that's what I add into various aspects of stories of my various characters. It's uh, And that's part of that vulnerability we were speaking about earlier. It, it speaks to laying bare my own emotions and putting them on paper that, people may agree with or not be able to relate to or, or just might hate. So uh, I, I've never really taken a real world s- situation that's happened to me and plunked it right down on the page because I have a feeling the reader can sense that. Um, just like, for example, if you're reading a Dan Brown book, you can see where we did all of this research and he just plops it right in there and it sticks out like a sore thumb. Uh, I try to blend it in a lot better than that. Um, and, you know, it makes it for interest it, interesting reading in certain genres, but not for my work, and, and it doesn't suit my voice. So, yeah, I've taken a lot of stuff that's happened to me and things that people have done wrong to me, and I try to uh, put my characters through the same thing, and usually they handle it a lot better than I did. Have you thought about uh, adding another genre to the list? You could do science fiction or uh, romance or something else along the way, because you've got historic or maybe a real historical fiction literature, because you do historical fiction in almost all your books, except for the espionage ones. Right. Yeah, I do. And I, you know, whenever I write this stuff, I, I don't write it for a certain audience, let's say. I don't, I know that my, I'm, I'm pleased that my work has some pulp aspects to it, but I never set out to write a pulp fiction piece. Um, I never write out, set to write a, uh, uh, a cutout of, of what you might expect, a stiche, if you will. I, I always try to put as much of myself and, and, the kind of story I want to read into what I write. So I do have, um, you know, I, I do draw from my own, my own experience and I do, um, I do try to make sure that the characters have something that everybody can understand about what they're looking to do, what their motivation is. So how do you know when, a, when, a, um, when what you've written is good? I never know if it's good or not. I always know when it's done. And it's funny because I usually have to go back and cut out an awful lot of stuff. And a few years ago when I was writing uh, a book for the Ralph Compton series, that one does have my name on it, um, They, I finished the book. It was completely done. It had to be 90,000 words. 
and it wound up being 70,000. And I was shocked by that because I poured everything out on the paper and I said, I told a complete story. Let me go back again and maybe I can add something to it. So I put a post-it note over the word count, spent a couple of days going back through it. And I was even more pleased with the story than I was when I finished it the first time. Took the post-it note away. I was 10,000 words less than what I had already put in. So I, I wound up cutting out 10,000 words. So then I was in a real fix. But that's when a writer learns more about themselves than they ever thought possible. So I had to put my nose to the grindstone, took the characters in a bunch of different directions, and I not only got it up to 90,000 words, but I wound up telling a great story in the process. So for me, I never, I always know when a, when a work is as complete as I can make it, but I'm never quite satisfied that it's done. But there's always a sense there as I'm writing it, I can see the clubhouse from there and I write towards that the ending will ultimately show itself. And sometimes it winds up ending completely different than the way I thought it would, which is always interesting for me. That's part of the thrill of, of my writing process. So it, what's more important or what, what's, what's kind of your, your structure in writing? Are you, are you starting with the character and putting them through something or you have the idea or the event, let's say, or the thing that's going to happen, then you choose to put someone into it. Right. I usually will have an idea in the back of my mind once I'm finishing a book before I begin the other one, whether it's within the same genre. Lately, I've been writing a lot of Westerns and uh, or if it's a completely different genre, I could be finishing up my spy thriller and say about James Hicks and say, oh, this would be a good point for uh, Charlie Doherty. Maybe I'll put and I'll take a few minutes and I'll write that down uh, if it's a. I'm not usually easily taken by my own ideas and I'm never wedded to them at the exclusivity of, of improvement. So I know that I might come up with something and it might seem like a good idea on a Monday, but by Wednesday, the story might've moved on from that. Maybe I'll have to go back and take that out. So I always start off with an idea of where I want to begin, sometimes of where it's going to end but I never let my preconceived notions stop me from the journey, enjoying the journey. So what's your relationship with your characters then? If you could, exp yeah, are they like friends, family, children? How do you describe them? I can understand them all. Uh, if they pop into my mind, I am able to, I'm not necessarily like them, but I can definitely understand what they do and why they do it. Uh, because uh, as we said before, it, it's all part of me. And earlier you mentioned about of, of evil characters. I always think of the most evil character that we've, we've read in a generation might be uh, Hannibal Lecter from Science of the Lambs, Red Dragon. And I love how Harris amalgamated that character out of a bunch of different work from his days as a crime reporter. And he took elements of a lot of different bad people and combined them into a fascinating character study of Hannibal Lecter. And I try to do that with my stuff too. I try to take people that I've, I've seen or met and maybe not, that maybe they haven't acted as admirably as they could have at the time and, um, use that to create the characters. So I already know them in the back of my mind. And so writing about them winds up being a, nature, a, a matter of course. Mm. So if, if someone's never heard of you before, um, what one book would you say would be best um, for them to read to get to know what kind of writer you are? Sure. I would say uh, my latest one is a good place to start to see if you like my style or not. Uh, it's The Wandering Man, and it's set in uh, 1927 New York. It's a prequel to all of my uh, 1930s stories. And it's written in the first person from Charlie Darley's perspective. It's, uh, he's a flawed character. He's a corrupt Tammany Hall cop in 1930s New York, 1920s New York in this case. He's a World War I veteran. And we get to see 
the world, not, o- not only the world through his eyes, but we also get to see the plot develop from his perspective. And he is somebody who sees the best and worst of everybody. And he doesn't see heroes. He doesn't see villains. He sees people who one day might be a good guy and the next day they might be a loathsome individual. And uh, my full storytelling abilities is on display in that book. And it's it's one I'm particularly proud of because it's not necessarily a uh, easy topic to write about. He uncovers a um, somebody who's based on the gray man, not the one that we just read about uh, on in the news and in the um, in an Amazon uh, Netflix, but he is, uh, but the actual gray man, Albert Fish, who started, uh, who was a uh, mass murderer in uh, 1930s New York. So I took something that was based in real life, changed aspects of the character and what happened, and put it into my own work. And uh, I'm pretty pleased with the outcome of it. You ever look back at any of your books and, and kind of want to rewrite them? Oh, all the time. Yeah. I mean, I grow with every book. I think every writer does, whether they write just one book or they write several short stories. Uh, I always am changing. I'm always evolving. Uh, when I wrote Sympathy for the Devil, my, my techno thriller, for example, I wanted to plunge the reader right in the middle of the worlds that I created that they might not understand, but that you would learn about it as you went along. Uh, later, the movie series John Wick came out. And we got a sense of that. That's what I was trying to achieve before the book, before those movies were even released. I was trying to plunge you into the middle of something and then slowly over time show you what was happening. If I was writing that book again, I would probably, and now that I'm a different now that you're grown writer, up. I probably would. Yes, and I have definitely grown up and changed in a lot of ways. I would have told a more expansive story that, covered more of the backstory and more of the more of his motivations for why he does what he does. But also too, talking about how our the times in which we create the fact this, um, it was a, when the the superhero movies were starting to come out and everyone was complaining that the movies spent too much time on backstory and they just wanted to get into the the meat of the story. So that definitely impacted my writing and how I approached it. But if I was doing it again, I definitely would have done more world building and gotten the, the uh, audience more familiar with Hicks and his motivations. So, um, okay. So do you like to interact with fans and, and readers and stuff like that? Do you do social media? Do you do a website? Do you do pickup apps? Like where, where do people find Terrence? Oh, I'm all over the place, Uh, you know, and uh, Joe and I share a publicist, uh, the great James Abbott. Uh, He uh, put him in the middle of the street in your westerns. Yeah, right. Exactly right. Yeah. He's usually the guy who gets rolled out of the street in the middle of uh, act two. But, uh, you know, and and it's not just because he has a bomb under my desk. Um, He is very good about making sure that we have a good Facebook and, and social media presence. He always comes up with great ideas. And so I'm all over Facebook. Uh, I have a personal page and then I have my professional page. I'm on Twitter um, with T McCauley underscore NYC. I'm always on there. I'm also on, uh, I have my own uh, newsletter that I send out at least once a month that covers a lot of various topics that are interesting to me. And there's always my website, T E R R E N C E. McCauley, M-C-C-A-U-L-E-Y dot com. Of course, we're going to have everything like that up on ours so people can find you with one click, you know. And, sure. Um, well, so um, you must have been writing uh, this over a lot of the pandemic. How was that? It was something. I wound up uh, leaving my job in the middle of the pandemic uh, right after it a lot of things were starting to close and realized that New York wasn't the same place that I had lived in my entire life. And so we moved up to Dutchess County and I dedicated myself to writing full time. And it's been a great journey. I've written uh, more than six books over the last year. Uh, Most of them have been Westerns. It is uh, a, a heavy pace and I don't recommend it to too many people. 
Um, it's it's my it, the impetus is on me because I'm the one who chose the deadlines, and it was good for me to take a step back from the person I thought I was as a as a professional person and exploit more of my creative tendencies. And I am confident that I've become a better writer as a result. Uh, earlier, I talked about how The Laundry Man is a good place to start with my books, but I've noticed a, a good change in all of my genres that I've been writing. Like I said, they've been mostly Westerns, but this kind of, this period of introspection and, and change that we've seen in the world has helped me add a, a layer to my art that I did not necessarily have before. And I'm better off yeah. for it. Yeah. Well, you 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 find that you're waking up in the middle of the night hearing voices then when you do a lot of writing and they. No, I try to do uh, to compartmentalize it as much as possible. Uh, I write usually from nine o'clock in the morning all the way up through uh, five or six o'clock at night. I try to keep it in a box and then I try not to do anything writing related during my off time. I'll, I'll watch the morning television in the morning. And then that'll give me some ideas to incorporate into my work. And then uh, I don't even take a break for lunch. Usually I'll have a protein shake or something. And then I just write through the day. Uh, it's a little bit hard on my hands. My back is bothering me a little bit. But um, it's definitely helping me as an artist. And I never thought I'd say anything as corny as that. But it's true. It, it's I can feel those different aspects of myself percolating and that's that's always a good thing so with all that writing and all that effort where is terrence in five years what's what's the series what's the book what's the what do you want to keep growing towards in your writing well i love all the series that i i currently have and i'd love to be able to keep them going but as uh, as we said on my podcast publishing is a business and uh you can't really uh forget about that so I'm happy to do what I'm doing. I want to keep every character that I've created, uh, the main ones in my series going, but I'm not stopping there. I'm constantly looking for uh, expanding my presence in the mystery genre. I've got another series that's set in the modern day that I am going to start pitching to people in the new year. And um, it's completely different from what, anything I've done before. It's more of a um, Formula One centric series that so we'll see if uh there's any interest there trying to get more of a, a very protagonist and, and base if you will um but i'm always looking for something else i've got another kind of thriller series in mind so i'm never going to stop creating i'm always going to be trying to push myself to do more and never abandon what i've already done because I, I still enjoy those characters especially the 1930s stuff that's I, I don't see myself being done with that in the near future. Publishing's a business? I didn't know that. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever told me. As we get reminded of it all yes. too often, unfortunately. But yeah, it is a oh, business. No one's ever told me that. <laughs> They're in life story, Alan. <laughs> That's right. What are you trying to say? Nothing, nothing, yeah. bad connection. Yeah, right, of course. Well, anyway, it's been it's been a pleasure. Um, we'll have everything posted up, like I said, and thank you for being on the show. Of course, our guest is the great Terrence McCauley, so thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me here. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.